Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors, and we are in the middle of our Brain Health Month, and I want to welcome uh, Jill Jones with us here today. Jill has been a longtime volunteer for TMC for Seniors, and she does a fabulous job um, facilitating all sorts of brain health classes for us. So welcome, Jill. Hi, Maya. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> so, so today, Jill is going to talk about the importance of socialization for brain fitness. I know that this has been a big struggle for everybody during the pandemic, and I, I think uh, Jill always has some great information that she can share and maybe some useful tools that you'll be able to use. Um, so, Jill, I'll look, go ahead and let you get started here. Well, as Mai said, this is about socialization and how it can improve your brain health. And I'm sure I bet a lot of you have heard about this before. It's, it's not something new or some new concept. But what you may not know is why socialization is important for your brain and how it can even change the structure of your brain. Good social connections can change the structure of your brain and improve your brain health overall. So let's first start by coming up with a definition of what we mean by brain fitness. It might be a little more expanded than what you've thought of. Most of us, when we think of brain fitness or brain health, we think more of the cognitive health. But this is a definition from the National Institutes of Health, National Institute on Aging. And they say it's made up of these four components, cognitive health, how we think, uh, how we solve problems, how good is our memory, and then motor function, how well we can move. I notice, think about yourself, I notice for me as I'm getting older, I'm stiffer. I can't move the way I used to. Some people are concerned about their balance. That's all under motor function. And then our emotional function. How well do we interpret and respond to, to emotional things? Sometimes we um, are more emotional than we used to be, or we might overreact. Then there's tactile function, which is part of this. How well do you feel and respond to sensations? For example, as we age, uh, we might notice that we feel pain more. We're, we're just more sensitive to pain. And, um, or, or temperature, we might notice that the, uh, it seems cooler or some people start running hot, but things change as we age. And so all of these together then make up the definition of brain fitness. The good news is we have the power to improve our brain fitness. We have the power to improve all of those areas based on our day-to-day -day activities, such as the food we eat, how much we exercise and move around, our um, mental activities, how much we challenge our brain, our social activities, which is the title of this presentation, Last time I spoke about quality sleep and the importance of sleep and cleansing the brain and also important for memory and building associations. And then resilience, how we handle stress. And I'm actually gonna talk about resilience next month. So all of these things added together make up our lifestyle. This is our life. This is how we, our habits day to day in, day to day in, in and out, 24 hours a day. This is what is considered our lifestyle. Um, and so some of this, not some people will say, well, how much effect do our genes have on our lifestyle? And they do, they have a, a considerable effect, but Interesting, as we age, our genes have less effect. But it turns out that we determine how much our genes affect our overall brain health. 
because traditionally when we think of genetics, that's the genes that are handed down from our parents. But the field of epigenetics, that's how we use our genes and how we use our genes determine the kinds of proteins that are made in our brain. So uh, for example, their lifestyle determines how our genes are expressed and a gene is, I think of it as a recipe. A gene's a recipe for a protein. And our cells make many, many proteins. And so everything we do, all those lifestyle habits affect the proteins that are made by our brain and some are proteins made by our cells. Some of those are good and some of those are not so good for our brain. So now neuroplasticity, when I said our brain changes, our brain has the ability to rewire itself, to make new neurons all the time. Every thought we have will make changes to our brain. So this is a question for you to think about as I move through the next couple of slide, slides. As you think about those six pillars, which of those, which Three of those have the biggest impact on changing our brain, can actually make our brain younger. Which of those have the biggest impact on boosting neurogenesis? That's giving birth to new brain cells. And we can give birth to new brain cells all throughout our lifetime in our 80s, our 90s and beyond, we can produce new brain cells and get rid of the old brain cells. We also can, are constantly building new neural connections anytime we're learning something new or experiencing something new. And all of that means we have the ability to make our brain younger. Go ahead. Now, neurons, as you know, are the considered the building blocks of our brain, but a neuron doesn't act alone. Neurons work together in groups of, uh, in groups of circuits. For example, uh, a nerve impulse, if we have some kind of an experience or we touch something, an impulse in one neuron, a nerve impulse will travel to another neuron, a chemical reaction happens, chemical reaction happens and they wire together, they connect, and they interconnect to make a circuit. And so a neural circuit, it's a group of neurons interconnected to carry out a specific task. And nowadays, scientists are looking at those circuits. We have the um, sophistication, we have the, the imaging technology now where scientists can look how look at how these circuits are working in real time. So here is an example of some brain circuits. For example, focused attention. That's a particular circuit in our brain. Ignoring distractions. That's another circuit, which is separate from our attention brain circuit. So this is something I talked about last year when I talked about the power of focus. Many of us, as we age, we still have the ability to focus our attention, but what we're losing is that other circuit is, uh, is declining, which is our ability to ignore distractions, to block out distractions. So that keeps interrupting our, our attention. Another brain circuit, or I should say circuitry, because this is way more complex, is our working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold information in mind long enough to complete a task. So right now, I'm really using my working memory to keep all of this in mind and think about what I wanna say next. So our working memory, that's about maybe only about 20 seconds to complete a task. So it's a combination of mental processes along with holding information in a storage area in our brain. So that's a number of circuits. And then motivation to learn. I'm excited about this 
This is a new discovery last year. It got reported out in um, October of 2020. We actually have a brain circuit for motivation, specifically motivation to learn, motivation to engage in life. That is a brain circuit. And you've heard the saying, my get up and go, got up and went. <laughs> well, in this case, that's what we're talking about with our motivation circuit. And here's, an, here's a good example of it. What happens is uh, neurons in a particular brain, are, first of all, we're having some kind of an experience will trigger neurons in one brain area. So for example, here, it gets triggered in um, near, near our memory and our emotions. And dopamine, a, a brain chemical, is sent to other brain areas. And that's called a pathway. Also, what's happening too is serotonin. A group of serotonin neurons is sending serotonin to a bunch of neurons in another area of the brain. And the direction of that flow of serotonin, it, that's called a pathway. So when those pathways and those neurons get interconnected to complete a task, in this case, motivation, that's a brain circuit. And that, this is a key message of this whole presentation. Our motivation is important for us to learn new things, to engage in anything, to do anything. We have to be motivated. And this is declining as we age. So we want to be aware of that and figure out how can we build back that motivation circuit. But we can. So let's move forward. So now looking at these pillars of brain fitness, the three that are most effective of building back those brain circuits are exercise, mental activity, and social activity. All these three together. And especially the social activity, being with our friends, being with a group of people, and doing some of these other things like exercise, that builds back our motivation. So go ahead. So let's start out with social activities. These, this study was done, um, uh, this study got reported out by AARP in uh, a publication called The Brain and Social Connectedness. It was published a few years ago there is a council called the Global Council on Brain Health that AARP convenes a couple of times a year. And what one year they looked into the importance of social connectedness in brain health, and they started reviewing lots of studies done on social engagement. This particular study was comparing different types of social activities and how it affected our brain. And they called it productive engagement versus receptive engagement. So for example, group one was a group of people. These were all people over 65 years old. Group one was in the productive engagement and they were learning. They were learning a new skill. They were learning how to quilt. Group two was also considered productive engagement. They were learning digital photography. The other groups, group three and four, they did things like uh, nature walks and going to movies, just casual social things. They weren't in the learning groups. And all of these groups, what they did is they met uh, 15 hours a week for, three, for a three month period. And their memory was tested uh, at the beginning of the three months, and it was tested at the end. Now, the good news is all of their memory improved. But, can move forward. The memory improvement in groups one and two 
the significant or was significant. These are the groups that were quilting and doing photography, but they were learning brand new skills. That's the key here. They were learning new skills while they were in a social group. The other social groups that just did walks and, um, and, and went to the movies and stuff, so forth, their memories improvement was slight, but it was an improvement. It didn't decline. So the next uh, study is about structural changes to the brain. They asked the question, are there changes to the brain structure and cognitive function in individuals who are socially engaged? This study is about, um, it was a, a random, actually a randomized controlled study. And what they did is they took adults, again, over the age of 65. I guess the average age was 67, but they were all over 65 years old. And what they did in the uh, control group, they had in the, um, well, they call it the treatment. <laughs> when they do these randomized control studies, one group is getting the treatment. And so that would be the mentors. They had uh, people in, in the first group mentoring young students. So they had to prepare lessons and then they had to go meet with the students and mentor them on different, uh, different educational things, different new learnings. Could you go back, Maya, one more? Oh, is it? Okay. So what happened is the, uh, so 60, uh, 65 of the group were mentors, and then another 58, they considered them low activity volunteers. And what that meant is they did things like Wheels on Meals, they delivered foods to adults, they were volunteer drivers to take uh, senior people to medical appointments and things like that. So that was the considered the control group, the low activity. And they did this 15 hours, for 15 hours a week for a year, move forward. And what they found was the group that was mentoring students, their hippocampuses grew. I should say hippocampi. We have two hippocampus, two hippocampi, one on each side of the brain. And both of those grew. Their memory improved. And not only that, their functional fitness improved. In other words, they were they those other areas that are part of the definition of brain health, if you recall, movement, they were able to move better, their emotions, they were happier. So if it affected them in many ways, but the biggest one on the cognitive ability, they had what was in effect a three year brain age reversal. And I, and I made a mistake back in the other chart. This, this study went on for two years, not, not one year. So instead of aging two years, their brain went back three years. So they were really five years younger brain age because they didn't age that other two years. The control group, their brain aged. Their brain aged the two years as would normally, uh, uh, as an average brain would do. So the moral of the story is, <laughs> Buddies help us build those motivation circuits. When we're with friends or we're with a group of people that are enthusiastic and uh, doing similar tasks that we're doing, we might be playing games or whatever, but especially if we're in a group where we're learning new things, it helps build our motivation. Go for it. So now moving on to the other pillars of brain health that give us that big boost in changing, making our brain younger. What are the ones that are the most effective at making our brain younger? Well, exercise is a big one. There's 
lots and lots of research that shows how exercise can make our brain younger and change the structure of our brain with new connections and also make a larger hippocampus. In fact, in this particular study, this is one that was only one year long, where people age 65 and up walked 45 minutes a day, only three days a week, 45 minutes a day, three days a week for a year, and they regained two years in their memory area. Their executive control, that's that prefrontal cortex, our cognitive ability where we do our thinking and problem solving, that improved by 20% and their memory improved by 20%. The next one, this is a recent one I just read about in the New York Times, it was a few weeks ago. They talked, this was a 2020 study again, uh, and about how exercise improves brain aging. But this time was they looked at, instead of specific functional areas of the brain, like, like last study where they looked at hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. This recent study looked at those brain circuits again. And what they found out is that after, uh, let me see, it was 20 weeks long, these, uh, this group of older adults met twice a week to exercise as a group for an hour, for a period of 20 weeks. What they noticed at the end of that 20 weeks, they looked actually through that special imaging technique, they could look at their brain circuits and they saw how their brains were working and their brains were working differently. Like they were younger. They said their brains were more flexible and it's almost like um, they were working in symphony their circuits just were so flexible like a young person after only 20 weeks. Let's move forward. So those are just a few examples of the importance of exercise and how you can quickly reverse some of these uh, changes in our brain and build back, build back a newer brain. This last one is on challenging our brain, the, uh, the brain pillar that was activity, mental activity that challenges our brain. And so I have some examples here. Now, the key thing on this chart, I underlined it. In order for these uh, mental activities to change our brain, we have to be consistent about it. It's important to schedule a time that we work that we practice to challenge our brain every day. Choose something that we like to do, that we're motivated to do, and know that we'll stick with it, even if it's only 20 minutes a day, but schedule that time and do it every day, and the changes will be dramatic. You can sprout new neurons, and you can make new brain connections, and make a younger brain. So one of those that's one idea on here that's really effective is, is if you learn a new musical instrument. And on the next chart, I have some examples of inexpensive musical instruments that you could buy and they're easy to learn. So if you move forward, there we go. These are Maybe you haven't even thought of these, but they're inexpensive. Oh, the ukulele, for example, it only has four strings, so it's easier to learn than a guitar. You could get a ukulele on Amazon for $25. You can get a really nice one, a mahogany ukulele for $65, and it even comes with lessons. Another idea is uh, that I happen to like the Native American flute. And so I looked online and I found one uh, for $50. And that's a, uh, a picture of one up there in the right corner. That's one that I had actually bought and I'm going to uh, try to train myself to use it. I have another friend who bought one and we're going to work on this together over Zoom. <laughs> so that's another way you can hook up with a friend maybe over Zoom.
until we're able to get together socially. Another one on there is called a recorder. I don't know if you've heard of that. Kind of reminds me of a clarinet, but um, it's also one that's easier to play. And you can actually get a plastic recorder for $15. I saw a concert, uh, a, a person, a concert professional play a plastic recorder and it sounded beautiful. So they have those in all prices. But the idea here is think of your fingers. And we talked about that tactile function of our brain. Not only are you reinforcing and training the co your brain's cognitive ability, but your fingers. I, I am having trouble moving my fingers like I used to. My hands just aren't as agile. But when you start playing these instruments, you're actually training the, those fingers and the movements in your hands, you're making your hands more agile, and that's building new connections in your brain. So other ideas on that chart that I had are uh, video games. Now we had talked about this last year, uh, the research that was done by Dr. Adam Gazelli, he found that uh, these young men in their 20s who were playing video games had incredible attention span and they had better memory. And they he found out that those ignore circuits were really strong. They could focus their attention and block out distractions much better than other 20 year olds who weren't happening to play these games. So what he did, um, Dr. Gazelli, along with some programmers who, who built video games, in the laboratory, they built a game that they were asking seniors to play to see if it could improve their brain performance. And so what they did, first off, they compared the brain performance of, of average 20-year-olds who had not played these video games. They compared them to 70-year-olds. And the first time they played, the 70-year-olds did very poorly compared to the 20-year-olds. But then what they did is they sent the 70 year olds home with a computer, one of those little um, handheld computers, and they asked them to play this game one hour a day, three days a week for only four weeks. After that four week time period, they came back into the lab and they were able to play the game as well as the 20 year olds. Not only that, it improved their working memory, and their ability to pay attention. Now that game isn't available to us yet, but it is coming and will be available shortly in the future here. But what they found is that quote at the bottom, the game induced a reversal in age-related deficits in prefrontal cortex ability. So I said, we don't have access to that particular game yet. However, I don't know if you saw the PBS special that was on a few weeks ago. It was called Brain Secrets and they featured Dr. Michael Mersneck. He is uh, a well-known uh, neuroscientist and he is noted, especially for one of the uh, inventors of the cochlear implant but he's also known for his discoveries in brain plasticity and how our brain changes and rewires itself. Well, so that program was on and he happened to have a team of neuroscientists that invented brain games that pay uh, particular attention to improving our memory our attention span, improving speed of our brain. That's really, that's something that declines as we age too. So anyway, he was promoting his um, brain games on PBS. His website is called Brain HQ. And you can go there if you want to, to play, uh, to, to play these brain games. You, it is a subscription. There's a fee for it. However, they give you a free trial to see if you like it and to see if you feel like you're improving. They start you out, the game starts you out 
fairly easily. And as you improve, it challenges you more and more so that you keep improving. One of the things that Dr. Merzenik Mers said in this special was that the number one best way you can change your brain is to focus your attention. Learn how to focus your attention and block those distractions. And that will change your brain for the better in a positive way. Now, this is the last one I have because I'm gonna talk more about this next, next uh, in the next presentation on resilience. I'll be talking about meditation but there are thousands of studies done about meditation and how it trains your brain to focus. And the military, every branch of the military has uh, a meditation program, a meditation practice, and they do it different ways, but most of them have adopted what the Navy SEALs are using which is called box breathing. And I demonstrated this once before, but it's a breathing technique and they do it. They pay attention to their breath while they're counting for 15 minutes at a time. So 15 minutes a day, they practice breathing, a, a particular type of breathing. And they've learned that that helps them helps their brain be clear and more focused, especially when they're in difficult situations like combat. They're able to block out all the noise around them and focus on the job to be done. So we will talk about that more next time. So this is my final chart. Um, and that is, as I said, one of the key messages in this presentation is getting that motivation circuit going, recharging that motivation circuit. And you can do that when you connect up with your friends. So thank you, Jill. I had a couple of questions that came in that I was hoping you could answer about, oh, you could answer for us. Um, one was about the circuitry. Do, should you work on one circuit at a time and master it and then, or should you be switching it up frequently? So for instance, if you concentrate on focusing your attention, then the next day do you tackle distractions or how, how should you, what's the best way to go about that? Well, what you should do, if, let's say I want to work on an attention. I would come up with a practice, a particular practice that's going to help me focus, that's going to help me be better focused and, and pay, pay more attention, be able to pay more attention. It's the practice that you do every day. So when you're working on attention, now let's say it's meditation, for example, it's that breathing meditation. What'll happen is that's going to be training other circuits at the same time. So um, when you pick a practice, It'll, it'll be training other circuits. It just ha happens to be the one that you're most interested in is attention at this time. So you would practice this meditation every day, let's say like the Navy SEALs do 15 minutes a day, every day for they, um, their brains changed after four weeks. When they first started this, it only took four weeks. Does that answer it? Yeah. So should you only work on the one at maybe focus on one at a time or do you think that you should do more than one at a time? You should focus on one practice at a time. OK, pick, pick a practice, yeah. which would be meditation or it would be playing that ukulele or it would be that one of those brain games. And what you'll see is not only did your intention, attention improve, some other things probably improved. But once you feel you have your, your attention and you're happy with that, then you could say, OK, now I want to work on my memory. And then you could choose another one that would work on your memory more. OK, 
Now, what if you are already doing some brain exercises, for instance, crossword puzzles, and you want to challenge your brain more with another activity? Do you lose the connections that you had you've achieved through the crossword puzzles by doing something else, or will you always have that piece as well now that you've maybe mastered? crossword puzzles? Well, that's the thing about crossword puzzles. It does help you with vocabulary, but it's not going to give you that uh, real huge boost in neurogenesis because you've been doing it. Once you start doing something over and over again, um, your brain gets used to it. The idea here, and I'm glad you asked it because that's a key point. Your brain has to be challenged. It's new things, new experiences. And you can tell if it's difficult, if you're pushing your brain. That's when you're starting to sprout those new connections okay. and create new circuits. Um, and I was just thinking, you know, uh, because we're always trying to do different things here at TMC for Seniors. We actually have an art class coming up, and not only does it have the socialization aspect because it is on Zoom, um, right. so you get to see other people, but we're doing something really different this time because we're doing, um, ah, I always get it mixed up here, small loom weaving, which is something sort of very different and may give somebody a new skill to try, maybe for brain fitness as well. Um, right. That's a perfect example. It's something new. It's actually learning a new skill. That's a perfect example. Yeah. So if anyone is interested in that, we'll be doing that. It's called Off Loom Weaving um, on April 7th. And uh, we register. There is a charge because there are materials fees and whatnot. But um, feel free to give us a call in the office if you're interested. The number is 520 three two four one nine six zero um and then i also i do want to also wrap up with brain health month we do have another talk this month um, that'll be next week it's on wednesday march 31st and we'll have neurophysiology about sleep and stroke um which was a, a, sort of a different topic than what we've discussed before yeah. Um, so I, I am excited that we'll have that as well, and that'll be at 2 p.m. So if you are interested in that, again, you can give us a call in the office at 324-1960, and we can, we'll be happy to register for you for that class. So that is all the questions I have today, Jill. I want to thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to having you next month. Um, when next month you'll be doing uh, building emotional resilience in difficult times. So <laughs> it's a perfect topic. Uh, next month is all about mental and emotional health. Um, and I know that uh, this has been a huge challenge for, for everybody. Um, so I'm so glad that you'll be able to come out and, and share, share your wisdom on, on that topic as well. So thank you for being here today. Well, I just want to say, if you have any other questions from today's presentation, you can bring those up next time. And, you know, I'm sure Maya wouldn't mind if we... <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you can certainly email us uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to get those over to Jill as well so that, so that we can, if, if you don't want to wait for, for an answer. So thank you again. Okay, um, you're you, welcome. Jill. And uh, we will see you next week. Okay. Bye, everyone.